and rejoice and be glad, for today the Lord has made. We continue with the reading of the Apostle by John Pollock. We're in part uh, 4, chapter 35, The Years of Freedom. A third letter remained before Tysias could leave for Asia, a note for Osimus to hand to his master. Paul knew that he must return Osimus to Philemon, and Osimus knew what could happen to a recovered slave. The only one of all Paul's epistles to be concerned solely with a personal matter, he chose him in a most engaging light, and without it any estimate of his character lacks balance. Paul, who had just consciously the authority voice of a mystery of Christ, will reveal to his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit, now showed the, now showed the tactful, diffident, kindly side of himself, even the humorous. He made puns on the most humorous, meaning useful or benefit. By implication, the letter to Philemon displays Paul's total rejection of slavery as a state capable, compatible with the gospel in a Christian society. Paul was no Spartacus calling slaves to revolt. A sudden end of slavery would reduce the Roman Empire to chaos. <coughs> and he was realistic enough to recognize that to agitate for abolition in his lifetime would be senseless, merely provoking the, the crushing of Christians as a menace to law and order. But he had taught consistently that in Christ there is neither slave nor free, since all are equal in the sight of their master Christ. Both the letters to the Ephesians and Colesian, Osimonus and Philemon being surely much in mind as he wrote, emphasized the new relation, relationship between slave and free, in which must each must look on the other as brother. And now he was sending back to Philemon not a piece of lost pro property, but rather a brother Christian, an honored follow worker. Philemon had the legal right to butcher Asumias, to whip or brand him, or put him to hard labor for life. Paul wished to save Philemon from doing wrong. And though Paul may have expected this personal letter to circulate its influence, and that his other passages about slavery eventually made the institution so distasteful that as Christianity permeated society that it withered slowly enough and died out in the Christian world, though many Christians were sold into slavery by their Muslim conquerors, it died out, only to be revived in the New World by Spanish and Portuguese Roman Catholics, despite condemnation by both the Pope and English Protestants, with all the distress and problems that followed. The incompatibility of slavery with the gospel is only implied. The letter itself is a window right into the hired house of Rome in A.D. 62. Tysias was absent when it was pinned, and the pinman probably was Timothy, Euphorus, Mark, Aristarchus, Demas, and Luke were sitting around with the inevitable soldier when Paul began to dictate for Philemon and his family. Opening as in the two letters with warm gratitude and assurance of prayer, I have derived much joy and comfort from your love, my brother, because the hearts of the saints have been refreshed through you. Accordingly, uh, though I am bold enough in Christ c to command you to do what is required, yet for love's sake I prefer, I prefer to appeal to you. I, Paul, an ambassador, and now a prisoner also for Jesus Christ, I appeal to you for my child, Osimius, whose father I have become in my imprisonment. Here Paul made his 
little play on words formerly he was useless to use but now he is indeed useful to you and to me i am sending back to you sending my heart i would have been glad to keep him with me in order that he might serve me on your behalf during my imprisonment for the gospel but I, I prefer to do nothing without your consent in order that your goodness might not be compulsion be by compulsion but of your own free will perhaps this is why he was parted for you for a while that you might have him back forever no longer as a slave but more as a, a slave as above as a more than a slave as a beloved brother especially to me but how much more to you both in the flesh and in the lord so if you consider me your partner receive him as you would receive me if he has wronged you at all it owes you nothing charge that to my account paul sees the pen and scroll i paul write this in my own hand and will rep repay it he handed back the papyrus and added to, and added to say nothing of you owing me even your own self yes brother i want some benefit from you and the lord refresh my heart in christ confident of your being obedience i write to you knowing you will do even more than i say paul sniffed the air of freedom himself the final words of the lever before farewells to philemon were confident he would see Colossae at last at the same time prepare a guest room for me as i am hoping through your prayers to be granted to you and he added a note to both the other letters about his coming trial pray for me he asked the ephesian that the right words may be given me that i may open my mouth boldly to make known the secret of the gospel for which i am an ambassador in chains that I, I may declare it boldly as i ought to speak his plan was to turn his trial into a testimony whether or not caesar presided for the first seven years of the reign when he was still under twenty five nero deputed the presidency of trials to the patreon perfect and the bluff straightforward burros and or the hated tell to 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 gel gelinus who succeeded him yet in a d sixty two he had begun to amuse himself for, by presiding and thus in the splendor star room justice hall of the palace of the palatine he may have heard Paul's reasoning of righteousness, temperance, judgment to come. The red-haired Nero's descent into extravagance and lust was gathering pace. He divorced the daughter of Claudius Caesar to marry Papia, Papia, the Jewish Pothalite, a previous wife of a close friend, and she encouraged Nero in vice and dispos disposism and had Paul's trial delayed much longer, her influence most likely would have overridden justice to secure his execution. Instead, whatever their personal reactions to Paul's plain speaking, the distinguished consuls and senators who sat as assessors apparently gave a majority of votes in his favor, and Nero, who often ignored opinion, anyway acquitted him. The effect of the verdict was substantiates Galileo's earlier decision. Christianity was ruled in Norway, an illegitimate cult. The gospel could be preached freely throughout the Roman world little more than 30 years since the crucifixion of Christ. No one then realized how utterly hollow this tolerance would prove. Paul's fetters were struck off. He left the Palatine Palace a free man the rest of his life probably about five years is known only hazily if we discount legends and late traditions the evidence of fragmentary three letters survive but the province of two of them the place of origins and the sequence in which they are written is uncertain 
and information about his personal movements light, and may have gone to Spain as he had planned when writing Roman Clement of Rome in his letter to the Corinthians thirty years later stated that Paul reached the farthest bounds of the West. Clement must have known Paul, but the phrase is vague. It could mean he evangelized as far as Cadiz, uh, the gates of the West, and looked out across the Atlantic, or that he evangelized the Celts. Christianity penetrated very deep into Gaul, up the valley of the Ro. But no local traditions mentions Paul, nor can a shred of reliable evidence support the Romans of Paul landing in Britain. The belief that he went to Spain was held firmly by several of the early fathers, although, again, there is no local tradition. Since he intended to evangelize Spain like Galatia, Greece, and the province of Asia, his time there could have stretched nearly to two years. Then he was back in the eastern Mediterranean with Titus and Crete, with Timothy and Ephesus. Despite Paul's earlier conviction, they would never see the elders again. And surely, as if all possible, he found his way at last up to the meander and Lycus valleys to enjoy Philemon's guest room at Colossae, served by a delight of one Simeus in his letters to Timothy and Titus. Paul mentioned being the, the militus and revealed his plan to spend a winter in Nicopolis, Nicopolis, in the Euphrates of Western Greece. Sorry about that. The picture at this point is of constant movement rather than settled work. Though slower, as if bones were old, rheumatism, arthritis were catching up, he was slower too in his style of writing. The sense of urgency was undiminished, for his work was being attacked on all sides. In the year 64, the favorable legal decision handed down and Paul's trial was turned into a mockery by the whim of Nero after the fire of Rome, when he defected the wrath of the populace from his own head by accusing the Christians of arson. The famous words of Tassius, then a child of ten, in writing fifteen years later, a vast multitude were not only put to death, but put to death with insult in that they were either dressed up in the skins of beasts to perish like the worrying of dog, or put on crosses to be set on fire, and when their daylight failed, to be burned for to use for lights at night. Nero had thrown open the gates for the spectacle, and was giving a circus exhibition, mingling with the people in a jockey's dress, or driving in a chariot, his excesses produced commerization com com with the Christians despite the unpopularity they had earned for rejecting the gods. Because people recognized that they were not suffering for the good of the state so much as to satisfy the cruelty of an individual. Praetorian soldiers who had learned to love Paul were among those ordered to torture his friends. Former guards who were now Christians were themselves dying in agony. In the way of Christians, and the way Christians died was in itself a testimony. In the midst of the flame and the, the rock, wrote Seneca, I have seen men not only not groan that is little, not only complain that is little, not only not answer back that is too little, but I have seen them smile, and smile with good heart. Survivors of the persecution took refuge in the catacombs, the worn caves and burial places deep under the outskirts of Rome. In Eastern Europe, Paul too have, may have had to go underground for his travels and preaching as the new imperial policy gained momentum in the provinces. The horrors of 64 certainly 
give point to his words written to Timothy at, the, at this time. I urge that petitions, prayers, intercessions, thanksgiving be offered for all men, for sovereigns of in all, in all high offices. They may lead a tranquil and quiet life in full observance of the religions and high standard of morality. Several of these converts or trusted elders made shipwreck of their faith. The unsettled times, persecution in Rome, Judea, Judea, seething with rumors of messiahs and with unrest about to explode in the great rebellion of A.D. 66 led to a ferment of ideas old and new, leaving for Macedonia Paul or Timothy at Ephesus to insist that certain people stop teaching strange doctrines and taking notice of endly geologies. These things are only likely to raise irrelevant doubts instead of purging the designs of God which are revealed in faith. To Titus in Crete, Paul wrote, of many insubordinate men taking empty talkers and deceivers, especially the circumcision party, the muse must be silent. Since they are upsetting whole families teaching a for base gain that they have no right to teach. Paul emphasized this in a spark of the old fire by a choice quote from Cretan poet Epimenendez of Gnosis. One of their own countrymen said, Cretan are always liars, vicious brutes, lazy gluttons. And he told the truth. Paul had to warn Timothy against ascetics who disprove of marriage and against conceited controversialists with a craze for questioning everything and arguing about words, which all led to jealousy, contention, and mistrust. He had to denounce those who sought to make money for, by Christian service and coined his memorable phrase, the love of money is the root of all evils. It is true this craving, he added, that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced their hearts with many pangs. But as for you, man of God, least Timothy himself should waver, shun all this, aim at righteousness, godliness, faith, love, steadfastness, gentleness. Fight the good fight of faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called even you made the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. Paul heartened and guided Timothy. Titus needed advice, but Timothy, the same timid and delicate yet sometimes self-willed Timothy, still very much a young man in Paul's eyes, needed encouragement and care, even in matters of health. Do not drink water only. But take a little wine to help your digestion since you you are sick so often. Let no one despise your youth. Paul urged, but set the believers an example in speech and conduct, in love, in faith, in purity, till I come attend to the public reading of Scripture, to preaching, to teaching. Paul was constantly traveling. Timothy and Titus stayed longer at one place, but they were in they too were in frequent movement at Paul's behest, strengthening a sorely tired Christian, rebutting falsehood, restoring the lamp. Paul did not resent the fact that, far from enjoying a tranquil old age, venerated, uncontradicted, honored, he must battle to the last, for he had expected this trouble. The Spirit says expressly, he said, he warned, that in after times some will desert from the faith and give their minds to subversive doctrine. Timothy, he begged, keep safe that which you have, which has been entrusted to you. Turn a deaf ear to empty and wordy chatter and the contradictions of so-called knowledge for who when came to it have shot wide of the faith. Why did the path lead to destruction? It was essential to build up healthy, expanding churches under local leadership. For God our Savior desires all men to be saved and to come to 
not only took truth, the two letters of the period, the first epistle to Timothy and epistle to Titus, quickly became classic as pastoral wisdom whenever Christianity spread. spread. Timothy and Asia and Titus in Crete were shown how to select and train elders, instructed about church discipline and worship, advised what to do about widows and others to, in distress or need, how young men and slaves and all other believers should behave so that Christians, however transduced or abused by Nero or their neighbors, might add luster to the doctrine of God our Savior. For Paul reminded Titus, the grace of God has drawn upon the world with healing for all mankind. The age Paul was more even sure. The age Paul was even was the age Paul was more than ever sure of the glorious gospel of the blessed God with which I have been entrusted. I thank him, he wrote to Timothy, who has given me strength for this, Christ Jesus our Lord, because he judged me faithfully by appointing me to his service. Though I formerly blasphemed and persecuted and insulted him, but I received mercy because I acted ignorantly in unbelief and in the grace and the grace of our Lord overflowed for me with faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. This saying is sure and worthy of all acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, and I am the foremost sinners of sinners. But I receive mercy for this reason, that in me the foremost Jesus Christ might display his perfect patience for an example to those who were to believe him for eternal life. That is, if you, Paul is saying, if he can save me a sinner, he can save anyone. It's to steal the same truth today. For me, an alcoholic, he saved me because his mercy came to me. To the king of ages, immortal, invisible, the only God be honored and glory forever and ever. And we finish with chapter 35. Shalom. I give the peace that just may glorify and help the body of Christ crawl closer to the Lord even as we see with uh, Paul the Apostle. Shalom again. Amen.